Hi, I'm Lauren Barron. I'm one of the cardiac surgeons at the Texas Heart Institute. Today I'd like to talk about arterial grafts and coronary bypass. Who should get them? When do we consider them? And why do we choose the conduits that we choose? I'll start out by going over the conduits. Let's start out with a saphenous vein. It's the oldest and most commonly used conduit in the United States. The pros to using this, it's pretty quick and easy. Low technical skill required to get this graft. It's the most forgiving tissue that you can use and the length is rarely a problem. But if it's so great, then why do we use something else? Well, the answer to that is patency. At five years, only about three quarters of these grafts are still open. When you compare that to the left internal thoracic artery where 95% of those grafts are still open, it's a significant difference. And when you go out to 10 years, that number drops to 60% for veins and about 90% for arteries. So it's not a great choice in a young person and it's also not a good choice in somebody who has varicosities. Speaking of the left internal thoracic artery, when we look at this, this is the gold standard. And why? Well, we talked about the patency, but people start to get a survival benefit after only five years. So after five years of survival, people live longer if you give them a left internal thoracic artery. The only real drawback to this is that it takes time and technical skill in order to get this conduit. So it's not a great conduit in someone who's having an emergency or someone who's in a salvage procedure. The other times when we have trouble using this conduit are when the person has subclavian stenosis and there's not great flow going through it. The other things that prevent us from using it are people who have had radiation or sometimes when people have had multiple chest operation, scarring prevents us from using this conduit. We talked about the left, so what about the right? Why do we always pick the left instead of the right? It really all comes down to the physical distance between the right side where the artery lies on the chest wall and the left side of the heart where we're trying to get um, the conduit to lie. When you look at it apples to apples, the right and left, if you put them to the same target, they have the same patency. The issue really is just the physical distance from the right side of the chest crossing over to the left side. It's a longer distance and it also puts the artery crossing the heart in most cases, which puts it at risk if you're doing a reduced sternotomy for running into that vessel on your way in. The last one that we commonly use is the radial artery. The pros to this one, it's quicker because you can harvest the radial artery at the same time as you're harvesting the internal thoracic artery, whereas if you're doing bilateral internal thoracic arteries, you can only do one at a time. The other thing is there's no increase in sternal wound infection when you have a radial artery as opposed to having two pedicled internal thoracic arteries. The cons, well these arteries are built a bit different and so they have more, um, they're more prone to vasospasm and their patency requires that the lesion that you put them to bypass has a higher degree of obstruction. These are not ideal for patients with renal disease where you're looking at perhaps doing a fistula. They're not great in people who have calcified arteries like people with peripheral vascular disease or chronic kidney disease. And they're not a very good idea in a patient with heart failure that you think might need high dose inotropes or pressors for a long period of time after surgery. So are more arterial conduits better? Two better than one? When we look at the observational data, so when we look at patients who got these and what happened to them afterwards, when you look at the bilateral internal thoracic arteries, we find overwhelmingly that these patients live longer. When we look at the radial artery, we find the same thing. Patients who got two arterial grafts live longer. What's the problem and why can't we assume that that's gonna last for everybody? Well, this is patient selection. Surgeons select these patients, so patients who are too ill or not a good fit don't get these. When we tried to look at these um, in arterial revascularization study, this is the ART trial, what we found was that this, was, this trial was intended to look at bilateral internal thoracic arteries compared to a single um, internal thoracic artery. We didn't really bet on that the radial artery would be pretty similar to a second internal thoracic artery, and the crossover was significant, like 14%. Um, and so the two groups came out the same. We did a post hoc analysis, and by we I mean as a group of surgeons, we looked at the post hoc analysis, so it looks like an observational study, and what we found was that when we looked at two graphs versus one graph, there was a survival benefit, but we're still limited by an observational study design. This is what's coming. This is the ROMA trial, randomized comparison of single versus multiple arterial graphs. The enrollment period has already passed, and we are in analysis at this point with the results coming out in 2027. The Texas Heart Institute will be participating in the second part of this, whereas we're looking at women because less than 20% of study enrollees are women and we don't have enough data to know if the things that are good for men, 
which is all of the previous data, are good for women. Um, so in 2029, we will hopefully have the answer for uh, whether or not we should be doing this in both men and women. The next thing we're going to move on to is patient selection. So we've talked about the conduits and why we pick the conduits. So now let's talk about why we pick the conduits we pick in the patients that we choose them for. It has to do with conduit suitability, lesion anatomy, age, comorbidities, and the level of risk for the surgery that we're performing. When we look at conduit suitability, we're looking at the difference between the radial artery and the internal mammary artery. There are anatomic differences, being that the radial artery has a big, thick muscular layer in the middle and is more prone to calcification and vasospasm. You can see that advanced age and smoking apply to both groups for what makes a conduit not ideal, but there are more things that make a radial artery conduit not ideal than there are for the internal thoracic arteries. When we look at the lesions, any artery does better if the lesion that it's bypassing is stenotic. And the more stenotic the lesion, the better for an artery. But when you look at radial arteries, they only approach the patency of a lemma, so the internal thoracic artery or the internal mammary artery, if the lesion has more than a 90% stenosis. Um, the location of the lesion also matters because, like we talked about on the right, the length of the graft is limited in both a radial and uh, the right internal thoracic. And you can create composite graphs for these, but that increases both the complexity and the operative time. So what about age? Well, it turns out when you look at patients over the age of 70, when you give them bilateral internal thoracic arteries or a radial artery graft, they get all of the risk without any of the benefit. So patients over 70 don't have a mortality benefit um, from having more than one arterial graft. The other time when patients don't really benefit is when they're high-risk patients. The list there on the left with end-stage renal disease being the highest, um, the highest comorbidity shows you what it looks like when a patient is high risk. And if you look at the top two graphs versus the bottom two graphs, you notice the ones on the bottom are overlapping. There is no significant benefit for people who are high risk. So when you're looking at arterial graphs, they're only good when the surgeon can balance the anatomy the flows around the lesions, and the comorbid conditions that are going to contribute to the success or failure of the graft in that patient. That's why the heart team approach helps so much. You have a primary cardiologist who has a much better idea of the patient as a whole and what their life has been like up to date and what they expect for their cardiovascular health of the future. The interventionalist who can help to make um, the angiographic data dynamic for you, and then the surgeon who has to make the interoperative decisions. So the truth of it is, arterial grafts improve survival and reduce adverse events in the right patient for the right reason in the right setting. 